Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the previous modules, we talked about static deterministic linearly square problems, weighted and weighted versions, well posed and ill posed versions. We also saw the natural relation between the least square solutions and a geometrical interpretation of the least square solution and that theory was very, very, very beautiful in itself. But very seldom the problems that we come across in geosciences are linear. Some are linear, some are many, but many of them are non-linear. So, in this module our aim is to be able to extend the concept of least square solutions to solve deterministic static non-linear inverse problems. So, let H be a map, let H be a map that means H is a vector valued function of a vector, X is a vector that gets into Rm, H of X that comes out is belonging to Rm. So, you can see this is the vector valued function of a vector it is also called a map. In meteorological context in geophysical context it is also called the forward operator. It is a map from the model space. So, R n is the model space this is the observation space. So, H is a map from model space to the observation space H has m components H 1 H2 HM transpose whether X is where X is Rn. So, given Z which is Rm given the nature of the function H our problem is to be able to estimate X such that Z is equal to H of X that is the problem nonlinear version of the least linear least square problem. The linear problem what did that we said there is a matrix H that goes from model space to the observation space. So, in that case we had the problem z is equal to h of x we have solved that problem now it takes the form z is equal to h of x. This we have already done the our question is how to do these problems how to do these problems and that is our that is our goal in this in this module. We are going to characterize this inverse problem again as an unconstrained minimization problem. Please remember that is exactly what we did when we did the linearly square problems. So, we are going to follow the same track of ideas the residual is z minus h of x m is a vector x is a vector. So, you can think of the residual to be z minus h of x and that is in R m. So, we can now concoct a function f of h which is the square of the norm of the residual. The square of the norm of the residual is given by z minus h x transpose times z minus h of x. The only difference is instead of using a linear function I am using a nonlinear function that is all what the difference is. If you multiply this and simplify you get z transpose z minus 2 times z transpose h x plus h x transpose h of x. So, that is a scalar each of this is a scalar function of the vector. We again seek to minimize f of x with respect to x and there is no constraint on x x belongs to r and that is why it is a unconstrained minimization problem. A standard way to solve the unconstrained minimization problem is to be able to compute the gradient from the module on multivariate calculus we have already seen we have already computed gradient of terms like z transpose h which is equal to 2 times transpose of the Jacobian of h times z. Again 
from that module on multivariate calculus the gradient of h transpose h is transpose of the Jacobian of h times h of x. This can be succinctly written by 2 times the transpose of the Jacobian of h h x minus z where please recall the Jacobian is simply a matrix of partial derivatives it is a m by n matrix Jacobian. So, if h of x is equal to h times x linear the Jacobian of h is simply h. So, by specializing this we can readily get the least square counterpart of this. So, this is in that sense is a generalization. So, we have computed the derivative in order to be able to maximize uh, in order to be able to minimize we want to be able to minimize f of x please uh, we want to be able to minimize f of x. In order to be able to minimize f of x I have to be able to equate the gradient to 0. If I equated the gradient to 0 as you can readily see I get a nonlinear equation where is the nonlinear of equ nonlinearity equation comes from there is a Jacobian of h times h of x minus. So, I will rewrite this now the, 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 the solution is essentially given by the solution is essentially given by Jacobian of x with respect to h h of x minus z must be equal to 0. Now, h is nonlinear d h is also nonlinear product of 2 nonlinear functions are nonlinear. Therefore, the gradient is, is a nonlinear function and we have to solve a nonlinear system of equations. The only way to solve a general nonlinear system of equations is to solve them numerically. So, one way to be able to solve the nonlinear least square problem is to be able to compute the gradient and use the well established procedures from numerical analysis to be able to solve the system of equations that is one way. So, I would like to summarize by saying there are a number of packages available and uh, these packages can be used to solve this, uh, this type of equation 3 and using that we can find the minimum of f of x the solution of these equation 3 corresponds to satisfies the necessary condition for a minimum and then in order to be able to guarantee they are minimum we have to compute the the Hessian we have to evaluate the Hessian at the roots then we have to test whether the Hessian are positive definite once the Hessian are positive definite then we have minima in general a nonlinear function may have many roots for this uh, uh, equation therefore, there could be multiple minima. So, this going to be computationally a very challenging problem. So, to get around that what is that we are going to be doing we are going to be looking at an alternate method we are going to be seeking good ways to approximate the nonlinear least square problems and that is what we are going to now describe. The approximation we are going to be talking about is called a first order approximation first order approximation to the function f of x. So, what is the basic idea let us pretend I now know where to start the solution that is the current operating point. Generally engineers and scientists know the range within which the solution is they may not know the exact solution, but it is supposed to be in this box or in this sphere. So, x c current operating point is some point that we already know which is not too far from the solution. So, that is contingent on our prior knowledge of this problem. Now, what do we do? We try to expand h of x in a first order Taylor series in a small neighborhood around the point x a. Again going back to our module on multivariate calculus I am going to be expanding h of x. So, you can think of the domain like this this is the current operating point x of c 
I am considering a small enough neighborhood around this, I am now considering a point x in a small neighborhood around x of c. So, x of c is the current operating point, x is the point I would like to move from x c to x. If x is close to x c, I can express h of x by a first order Taylor series which we have already seen in our module on multivariate calculus. So, h of x of z is the Jacobian of h at the point x a which is so I can so given h I can always compute the Jacobian if you give me x c I I can evaluate the Jacobian matrix numerically. So, the numerical value of this Jacobian matrix is known h of x c the value is known x c is known. So, you can simply see it is simply a function of h of x it is simply a function of h of x that is the vector is the vector function. And not only it is the function of x you can also see it is linear in x. So, it is a linear approximation to h of x around x a. So, what is that we have done h of x is defined globally, but I have replaced the global h of x by a local linear approximation using a first order Taylor series in a small neighborhood around the current operating point. So, that is the key to this argument. So, what is that we are going to um, uh, do instead of solving the problem globally we are going to solve the problem locally and keep making local improvements with the hope that these local solutions and local improvements will ultimately eventually lead to the global solution. So, in, in here we have converted a nonlinear problem to an associated linear problem by invoking to the first order Taylor series using Jacobian. So, now if you go back to our previous slide my f of x consists of h of x h of x. So, what is that we are going to do we are going to replace these h of x in equation 1 I will come back here. So, now replace h of x in equation 1 by the right hand side of 4 the right hand side of 4 is simply a linear approximation to h of x. So, if I did that I am going to get a function q 1 of x q 1 of x is an approximation to my f of x in a small neighborhood. So, f of x is a global function q 1 of x is a local approximation to the global function you can readily see q 1 of x is given by a linear part and a linear part multiplied together. So, this is a quadratic approximation. So, this is a quadratic approximation where g of x is equal to g minus h of x instead of writing z minus h of x c I am I am. So, g of x c will be h of x c. So, g is a change of variable for z minus h of x. So, this quadratic approximation of f of x in a small neighborhood around x of c. So, what is that we are going to now look at we are going to be looking we are going to be looking for minimizing q 1 of x. If I want to be able to minimize q 1 of x I can readily compute the gradient I can compute the hessian of q 1 of x. Again by the results in the module relating to multivariate linear algebra the gradient of q 1 is given by these expressions the hessian is given by this expression. Now, please recognize the hessian is the transpose of the Jacobian times the Jacobian evaluated at the point c this looks like h transpose h. So, there the inverse of it exists if h is a full rank here the inverse of it exists if the Jacobian is a full rank. So, if the Jacobian is a full rank then the Hessian is positive semi definite if the Jacobian is full rank and the Hessian and the Hessian is positive semi definite the equation to the, 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 the solution of the equation the gradient setting it 0 in 7 must give the, the, the optimal or the minimum solution. Therefore, by setting the right hand side of 
7 equal to 0 I do not have yeah I do not have to say 9.7 it is simply 7 by equating the right hand side of 7 to 0 we get the minimizer of q 1 as a solution to the normal equation. The solution to the normal equation is given by this matrix times this is equal to this matrix times g. Now, I would like you to look at this structure. This structure is very similar to h transpose h x is equal to h transpose z that we saw in the linear case. There we got the global solution. Here I am getting the local solution. Local solution. So, by solving this then this matrix is symmetric and positive definite. So, it is non singular. So, I can express x <coughs> minus x c is equal to the inverse of this matrix times the right hand side. So, I, by solving this I am going to get x minus x c. I originally got x c. So, so originally I started with a point x c. I went to a point x I went to the point x. So, if I add these two together I, I go from x c to x the optimal x that minimizes the linear approximation. So, my new operating point is equal to the old operating point. So, this is the old operating point plus the increment plus the increment that gives you a new operating point then I repeat the same show around the new operating point which is x c nu. So, now I will consider another small neighborhood around the around this new neighborhood I will consider another x I will go from here to here. So, I went from here to here then here to here then he there to there. So, by moving sequentially from operating point to operating point to operating point I am moving towards the global solution so, this whole process is repeated from the new operating point until a suitable convergence is obtained. So, what is the key here I am converting a difficult I am converting the difficult problem of solving a nonlinear least square problems globally to a sequence of simple linear least square problems we already know how to solve linear least square problems. So, the, 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 the trick is if you know how to solve one problems very well I can convert other problems to one that I know how to solve and using the algorithms for solving the linear problem I can continue to solve the nonlinear problems iteratively. So, you can see the difficulty of nonlinear problems essentially comes from our inability to 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 look at the global solution at one 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 juncture at, at, at in, in, in one shot I am trying to build the global solution by sequence of local solutions. Thus far we saw the first order approximation now I am going to go to the second order approximation just to be able to tell you if my function h of x is strongly nonlinear what does it mean if it involves logarithmic functions exponential functions trigonometric functions or fractional powers of uh, 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 fractional powers of different quantities of interest. For example, what is one typical nonlinear function in the case of satellite meteorology energy radiated is equal to alpha to the power t to the power of 4 the temperature that is a very strongly nonlinear function the energy radiated is it is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. So, if I so z in this case z is equal to so this is equal to h of t. So, this is equal to h of t t is the state variable. So, x plays the role of t and uh, z is equal to h of t in this case very strongly nonlinear in this case linear approximation will not come very very handy linear approximation has a lot of errors in order to be able to improve the quality of the approximation 
I am now going to go from first order to second order terms. Again you can readily see all these things are related to first order Taylor series, second order Taylor series for vector valued function of a vector is all the things that we have already covered in the module on multivariate calculus. So, in this case in addition to the first order term I am going to have a second order term. The second order term addition of second order term improves the accuracy of the Taylor series approximation. The second order term depends on the Hessian. So, this second order term is given by a vector please understand h is a vector h of x e is a vector this d of h uh, d of h of x e is a Jacobian matrix evaluated x e y is a vector. So, this is a vector this is again a vector the vector is given by now look at the following. Now, we already know h is a function which is which consists of h 1 h 2 h m transpose. So, you take h 1 computes Hessian that is the matrix there is the quadratic form with the Hessian of h 1 this is the quadratic form is the Hessian of h 2 there is a quadratic form with respect to Hessian of h m 1 over half the half comes from the second order term Taylor series coefficient. So, this whole vector will 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 go in here and how do we express this I would like you to be able to think of it like this this is x of c this is x the difference between them is y is y. So, y is the distance between the current operating point and any other point x in the neighborhood of it. So, y is equal to x minus x c that is a vector that is a vector in R n del square h of i is the is the Hessian of the ith component h i. So, the Hessian of the ith component of h i. So, with this I get a, a reasonably good expression for the second order Taylor series for h of x and that is given by 11. Look at the notation the notation could be little 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 complicated for some of us who are not familiar with dealing with uh, uh, Taylor series expansion. So, it is very imperative we understand the Taylor series expansion for multi uh, vector valid functions of vectors in order to be able to get the complete total understanding in here what is happening around the current operating point x e. Now, what do we do? So, we are going to do the same thing. So, I got I got an approximation for h of x in 11. So, I am going to substitute 11 in 1 to be able to obtain a new approximation for h of x. Again we are dealing with approximation. So, this is one term this is another term. Now, what is y please remind yourself y is equal to x minus x c x c is known. So, I can recover x if I know y. So, I am simply talking about the 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 increment y. So, so f of x is now expressed in terms of y again g has the previous value g minus z minus h of z z minus h of z. So, expanding the right hand side the right hand side has now 3 terms if you multiply the whole thing you get an approximation in terms of I would like to call it y sorry that that is not that is not x it should be y. So, we expand the term if you expand the term look at this now this is a the g is a constant term this is the first order term this is a second order term in y this is a constant term this is a first order term this is a second order term. So, each one of the factors are quadratic functions if you multiply 2 quadratic functions you are going to get a fourth degree term in the components of y. So, what do we do we expand but keep only the second order terms in y. So, what is mean what do you mean by second order terms second order or the second degree in the components of y there will be third degree term there will be fourth degree term we are going to neglect this third degree term and the fourth degree term why we are allowed to neglect the third and fourth degree term. 
if x is close to x c h is small uh, y is small if y is small y square is smaller y cube is even smaller y to the power of 4 is even much smaller. So, we are simply invoking to the order of magnitude scaling process involved in here. So, we are only going to keep the dominant term up to the second order we believe third order term and fourth order term are essentially essentially very small. So, by keeping only the second order approximation I get an approximation of f of x as q 2 of y q 2 of y is given by these terms. I would like to look at this term for a minute. This term is of degree 0 the first term is of degree 0 the second term is a linear term the third term is essentially a quadratic term look at this now the third term this is quadratic in y and by the definition of second order term that is also quadratic in y the sum of two quadratic terms is a quadratic terms. So, q 2 of y is quadratic q 1 of y was also quadratic, but in this in the in the case of q 1 of y I did not have this term. So, this is the new term that comes into play if I use the second order approximation. So, this is new. So, that is why we are going to call q 2 as a full quadratic approximation and q 1 as only a partial quadratic approximation that is simply a mathematical fact that comes out of this analysis. So, if you drop the second order term you q 2 becomes equal to q 1. So, that is the important nesting that we have to look at that. So, quadratic approximation is obtained by simply adding a second order term which is the last term in equation 15. So, that is summarized in the following discussion q 2 differs from q y with the addition of the fourth which is the second order term on the right hand side of 15. So, I had f of x h of x by a second order Taylor series I substituted that I will get second degree term third degree term fourth degree term we dropped the th every term larger than the second degree. So, q 2 y is the total or full quadratic approximation of f of x. Now, the problem becomes very simple I have a quadratic function I would like to be able to compute the, uh, the gradient of the uh, 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 this quadratic function in 15 and that I do in stages I am considering q g transpose d square h of y this is the term that we have added is a new term that comes into q, q, q 2 that was not in q 1 this term if I expand it. So, g is a vector g is a vector d square is a vector I am talking about the inner product of two vectors the inner product of two vectors is given by the sum of g i times the quadratic formula. Hence q 2 of y now can be replaced by this constant term first degree term one second degree term and the second second degree term. So, you can readily see the quadratic function coming in here you can also see the quadratic function coming in here these two are quadratic that is the linear. Therefore, I can compute the gradient of q 2 again we are invoking to the module on multivariate calculus the, the gradient of this gives rise to this the gradient of this gives rise to this the gradient of this gives rise to this and I am going to equate this gradient to 0 to get my solution. I also get the hessian of q 2 this is the gradient of q 2. So, I have computed all the required quantities in order to be able to compute the solution I simply need to be able to set the gradient to 0 I am I'm, I'm going to have to set the gradient to 0 the setting the gradient to 0 gives rise to gives rise to a linear system where the system matrix is given by this. So, this is like a y is equal to b where this is the matrix a this whole thing is the vector b and I am going to solve for y. Now, I would like to look at this matrix. So, this is the Gramian that comes out of the, the Jacobian this is the term that comes out of the 
Hessians are the components of that GIs are the constants the GIs as you if you re, if you recall G is equal to Z minus H of X. So, GIs are constant. So, this is each one of these are matrices. So, this is the linear combination of matrices multiplied by GI. So, this is the matrix this is the matrix I can solve this matrix equation. The solution of this matrix equation is going to give me a y least square that least square solution is in will indeed that, that solution will indeed be a least square solution provided provided this hessian term is positive definite provided this hessian term is positive definite. So, this is essentially another way of looking at approximations to the the uh, uh, nonlinear problem using second order approximations. Again we are going to we are going to solve 20 for y if I solve for y please remember y is equal to x minus x e once we have x minus x e we can compute we can add x minus x e to y that gives you a new operating point. So, here again I am going to go sequentially I have x e then I am going to x e new operating point from here I am going to go to another new operating point we can call it new new and the conversion goes on. So, I am solving a sequence of local minimization problems by using clever partial quadratic form approximations or full quadratic form approximation to the function f of x. So, the entire process of second order approximation is repeated until suitable convergence is obtained. How do I say suitable convergence? When do I say the convergence has occurred? If the norm of y you compute y if the norm of y is less than a pre specified epsilon and what is that epsilon? The epsilon could be 10 to the power of minus d and what could be that? That could be you can set the criterion any way you want 0 0 1 or 0 0 0 1 or 0 1 these are all the typical values of epsilon one could utilize. And so, if d is large your approximation is better if d is small the approximation is crude. In some problems if the model is not a perfect model it is not worth worrying about exact solutions you can afford to uh, uh, get reasonably uh, 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 good neighborhood but not nearly exact d could be need not be too large in such cases. So, it all depends on how well you believe your model is how well you believe your method should be your method need not be more accurate than the model. So, more accurate solutions are needed only when the model is more precise. I, I want you to be able to think of this consistency between goodness of the model versus goodness of the solution that you obtain by virtue of data simulation. So, the idea behind these two approximations is that the solution can be obtained by solving linear system with SPD matrices using the normal equation approach. So, what is the basic idea here? We develop the expertise in solving linearly square problems. Once we have a good expertise in solving linearly square problem we are readily extending that expertise to solve nonlinearly square problems by approximating the nonlinear function using either the first order Taylor series or the second order Taylor series. So, that is the idea that is the idea. So, understanding linear least square problem is fundamental and if you do and if you understand it very well if you have developed programs to solve the linear least square problems you can readily apply them to solving nonlinear problems. But nonlinear problems are not solved in one shot they are solved repeatedly. So, it is a sequential approach to solving nonlinear problems using a sequence of linear problems. With this we come to the end of this module there are a couple of different exercises. Uh, these are very useful exercises I want to emphasize couple of these um, f of x is a very simple function I would like you to consider x of c as a starting point compute the first order and the second order approximations for f of x around x of c find the gradient in the Hessian of f of x at that point draw the contours of f of x around x of c also draw the contours of the 
first and second order approximations around x of c you can see how these contours approximate the, the, the solutions of the problem as we progress from one operating point to another operating point to another operating point the you can you can understand and appreciate the, the progress of the local solution towards the global solutions. With that we come to the end of the discussion of solving nonlinearly square problems. Thank you.